to make things personal by uh, the recording just started. So welcome everybody to the first Student Voice webinar. Uh, it's great after all this time of tweeting together to actually make things personal through this webinar. Uh, yesterday's Education Nation Student Town Hall uh, provided us with a great opportunity to uh, have the student voice heard and we want to continue that and make ensure that the student voice is authentic. And by doing so, we wanted to host this student voice chat. So to start off, I want to thank Lisa Nielsen and Steve Hargadon for hosting this. Uh, they've been great supporters. And with that, I think we'll get started. A couple of our uh, panelists are just joining in. They're running in from other webinars and uh, other events. But I think we're ready to go. So. Slide two. Like I said, my name is Zach Malmud. I'm a student at the University of Maryland College Park. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am the founder of the Stu Voice Twitter chat, and uh, I'm also one of the organizers of StuVoice.org with many of the other students in this webinar. Great to see all these people in the chat. Uh, our panelists are Nikhil Goyle. Nikhil, are you in here yet? Nikhil's running over from another webinar. I know Stephanie Rivera just joined. So while Nikhil's running over, I'd love to have, uh, well, actually, Teresa Soros introduce herself so Stephanie can get herself settled. Teresa, do you mind introducing yourself briefly? Hi, everybody. My name is Teresa Soros. Um, I am a blogger, a journalism student at Mills College in Oakland, California. Um, I've been participating with Stu Voice and the movement um, for a couple of months here. So it's been great um, and I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm an advocate for people with learning disabilities. I'm highly interested in special ed and um, what the, the learning movement is doing around that. Um, so I'm happy to participate here and um, very much looking forward to uh, the webinar. <laughs> Great. Welcome, Teresa. Uh, Nikhil is just asking you where the link is, so he'll be in a very shortly. Stephanie, do you mind uh, introducing yourself? Just press the talk button, Stephanie. Okay. Is it on now? Yep, we can do. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm in a really frazzled state right now. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm a student at Rutgers University. I'm studying education and English while participating in a bunch of political science stuff as well. Um, I've been with Stu Voice from the beginning, so this is really exciting to see how far it's gone. Um, I also run my own blog, if you are interested in reading it, um, teacherunderconstruction.com. And I think that's basically it. Is that all, Zach, or is there anything else I should Oh, that sounds good. That sounds great, okay. Stephanie. Uh, Hong, would you mind introducing yourself? Can you hear me now? Yep. Um, so uh, my name is Hong Go, and I'm the chairman of the International Youth Council USA. And I'm also a high school student. And so my work for the International Youth Council mostly consists of networking youth and creating opportunities for them to contribute in their community, as well as kind of facilitating intercultural dialogue. And um, we're co-hosting a World Forum next year, which is focused around education, entrepreneurship, and um, innovation. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be one of the panelists here today. and I love the opportunity to hear what you guys have to offer on the issue of education. Very impressive and very happy to have you too. Uh, Nikhil, I see that you're in and ready to go, so feel free to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Nikhil Goyle. I'm a 17-year-old high school student and I just wrote a, published a book, One Size Does Not Fit All, A Student Success in the School. And I write for a number of publications, like The Times and Good Magazine. And uh, I'm really interested in, in this discussion. I'll, only, I'll be saying my intro, and then I'll be gone for about 15 minutes on the subway. But I'll be back. Um, so thanks so much for having having us. Welcome, Nikhil. Um, Melvin's having trouble accessing us, so I'll hold off on introducing him. But a few of his friends are in here representing uh, his community. 
and uh, that'll be great. It'll be great to hear from them too. Uh, Nikhil, would you mind turning off your mic? There's a little bit of background. Thank you. All right. So we're going to start off with the Education Nation Student Town Hall. And I'd like to start with Stephanie on this one with reflections on the first hour, the second hour, uh, thoughts on the student panel. Uh, and did you, did you like the panel? Did you dislike it? What are your thoughts on that? Okay. Um, I think, as I mentioned before, is that I was kind of disappointed that they waited until the very end to put students on the stage. Um, but other than that, I thought, I feel a little weird about the panel because, of course, they were all incredible students and very, very inspiring. And, of course, Nikhil is one of my favorite people people in the world. Um, but I think, like you tweeted, Zach, that I don't know if normal would be the term that I would use, but more people that we could maybe relate to, I think, in a way, would be more realistic or that's what I would have been really happy to see on that panel. Um, I, I, being completely honest, I didn't really take away anything from that student panel. I kind of was a little not interested, to be completely honest, with um, with that panel. So I don't know if anyone else felt differently, but that's just coming from my perspective. Right. I, 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 I've heard that from a few students. I wonder, Teresa, do you have uh, similar sentiments on that? Uh, I do. I think, uh, Stephanie, you hit it right on the money. Um, I felt like they really touched on the surface of a lot of issues, but um, there, I, I think the panel was lacking diversity, uh, not racially, but um, yeah, I would have liked to have seen and heard a lot more from the students. And again, uh, I thought it was very strange that they waited until the end to bring on the student panel. Uh, so I thought that that was very odd. Right, and what I heard from uh, many of the attendees was the fact that the audience actually consisted of mostly minorities and didn't fairly represent the, uh, the population of New York City and really America as a whole. And many were disappointed with that. But beyond that, the, the, the session did start with politicians up on stage as, as panelists. Do you feel like you learned anything from the politicians or in the future would, I mean, my preference would be to have the politicians actually listening to the students? So, uh, Hung, what, what do you think about that idea? And with your organization, do you think that that may be something that you would look into doing? Um, in regards to the diversity on the panel? Well, not just or, the diversity on the panel, but the fact that the, the panel started with politicians, that the first panel had consisted of pol politicians. They focused on the Romney campaign and the Obama campaign. So, in, I guess with your work, would you, do you agree with the idea that maybe we in the future should look at having the politicians and the policymakers actually listen to the students rather than the students listen to them? Because uh, yeah. many would agree that we listen to them way more than they do listen to us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, because um, by kind of introducing the politicians in the beginning, it kind of um, asserts a subliminal assertion that they're the ones that have, like, the power, like, the ability to decide our education, while the students at the end are actually the ones that are, should be in charge of it. So I definitely think that it was kind of a poor choice for the politicians to kind of begin to talk about um, the issue. And definitely it's something that the International Youth Council will work on in the future with politicians to kind of um, change that as well as turn the world forward. Well, you have experience working directly with the governor of Nebraska. And I, I think it would be great yeah. if you actually spoke about that and how youth can actually engage with their, their you know, the, the politicians in their community and make sure their voice is heard. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people do struggle with that, and I think you've had a lot of success with that. So definitely elaborate on that if you can. Um, so, so yeah, from my experience with kind of, um, kind of voicing out my opinions, is to just go to the Capitol and talk to the public servants because they're there and they actually hear you out, but only if you go. And uh, for my senators specifically, they're extremely open to what the youth has to say, but they do have a lot of things on their plate. Um, and I know that from experience because I do intern for one. And so unless you kind of reiterate your point 
and kind of just push for that message over and over again, it's just going to get um, pushed back. And um, luckily, my state focuses on education. The majority of our funding goes to education, but it goes to kind of the wrong areas of improving education. And it's something that um, the Governor's Youth Advisory Council will be working on with the Governor this upcoming month to just tell him, okay, this is what um, we're doing in school and this is what the students want because the majority of our funding goes to kind of different schools and different levels within that schools and it's not a fair um, allocation of funding. And so, yeah, from my experience, it's, it just takes a group of students to voice their opinions and it will go far because they're extremely receptive. Great. And I guess going back to the, the student town hall, um, there, I, I guess there's a lot of opposition to education nation and people feel like this was uh, more of a, a production to say that they use the student voice rather than to actually ensure that the student voice is, is enhanced and, and to ensure that they feel empowered moving forward. So, uh, Teresa, what do you think should be done uh, moving forward to make sure that students, uh, the, the voice is authentic uh, and to ensure that, um, that, that you know, it's, it's not a, a production that, you know, puts politicians on a pedestal but really puts everyone on a level playing field. Because uh, uh, what we heard uh, from, I think Nikhil was speaking to some of the producers, they, they were just scared to put students out there. Why, why should people be scared? And how do we prevent people from being scared moving forward? Because like we've seen with the Stu Voice set and like we see tonight, uh, when the students are asked to speak out, they certainly do and they have a lot to share. So Teresa, definitely can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think just looking at the audience that was in the room, it was mostly students. That room was just entirely filled with students, which it was a student town hall. But I do think that it's very important to look at the audience because the student voice is so incredibly important to get out there because it's authentic, it's organic, and it's very important. But really, unless we're getting administrators and politicians to actually listen, and, and, and become involved, they should have been the ones asking us questions, I think, in many ways. Because it's very great, it's very wonderful for us to come together and sit and, and to discuss how we can change education. But if they're not listening to us, if they're not taking the time to actually put forth and ask us questions and ask us how we want to get involved, because really it's, it's a two-way street here and we have to work together. And um, sitting here from the point of, uh, name calling or saying that you know Education Nation and the way that they produced it was very superficial. That's not going to solve anything. Um, everybody needs you know to really come together and work together on how we can move forward and make the next student town hall better. And I think that the really the best way to do that is to capture the organic voice. There are so many so many different student movements and student led movements that are happening within. Uh, public public school and um, unified school districts all over the United States and things that I've been exposed to just in the past month of being in Oakland that I'm very much looking forward to capturing and, and getting those on the internet and really hearing from students. I think the key to this movement is hearing exactly what is going on from the students. Blogging and internet and technology and all of the innovation surrounding that uh, is really the key here. Right, 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 right. So you bring up a key point. I think that you know there was a student town hall, there was a teacher town hall, there was a parent engagement uh, forum. Why are we all separated? Why are we all considered you know to be different and to have different interests when we're all working for the students? And I know Stephanie, you have experience working with teachers, with students for both parties. Uh, do you think that they could work well together? Do you think that there's a reason that they are separated, or do you think it's time to really uh, bring everyone together, put them down at the same table, and say, you know, you guys should work together and discuss your differences? Uh, because, uh, you know, Education Nation seems to uh, insinuate that everyone has different interests, and that may not necessarily be the case, but what do you have to say on that?
I think that is an excellent point that you bring up. Um, as I mentioned often, it's really interesting the position I'm in because I'm a student who is studying teaching and education. I think I understand why some may want to separate us because we do all have different perspectives, but I strongly believe that is critical that we all find a way to work together because like you said, we all have the same interests, we all have the same goal, we all want what's best for the students, and that's what all of our passion goes towards. So I think in order to work together, there does need to be an acknowledgement of where you stand, I guess, I guess acknowledging your privilege or acknowledging um, the differences that all of us have, but really starting to listen. Um, at the public hearing that I was at tonight, a lot of people had issues with our commissioner um, because he, we, they all felt that he was making decisions without reaching out to the students, reaching out to the parents or the teachers. And all the teachers and parents said, we all want to work together. We want to hear what the students want, and they want our commissioner to listen to what the students want. So it's definitely a struggle, and it definitely would be hard to all work together. But if we don't find a way, we're going to be, keep running around in circles. And that's the perspective I have as a student and as a future educator. Great, great. Uh, I definitely, and I think you, I think on that note, what would you do, Stephanie, and we'll go to the others, I think it feels trying to join us again. Uh, what would you do to improve the student town hall next year? Uh, it's like it's been mentioned, I think that we should be reaching out to authentic voices and allow for everyone from all different places, I don't know, I don't understand why it was closed off. Is it because it was such an expensive event or, I don't know, that really confused me and it was upsetting when I was getting texts saying, hey, can I come? Why is this event closed off? It's the student town hall. So I think that as well as um, obviously having more students on stage, I think is very important for the student town hall. And um, I don't know, I really like the questions that were asked So and allowing for the students to speak outside from the audience, but there needs to be more voices represented. Right, and Hungvo, with your experience organizing students, do you think we even need an organization or, or a corporation like NBC to bring students together like this uh, to speak out and really enhance and elevate their voice? Or do you think students can do it on their own or with uh, other organizations that aren't as uh, prominent as something like NBC? I definitely think that organizations Smaller ones or organi organizations like IYC should help the students to kind of um, empower them because there was a survey conducted by the IYC and it's still going on but the um, second most popular choice that um, students chose for why they don't volunteer or kind of do things like this was because they needed the push and so um, I think that um, there should there has to be a role to kind of push the students because, you know, it sounds kind of naive to say that they'll just kind of do things on their own, but in reality, we need them to kind of voice their opinions and take action, so there has to be a push. And um, I, I think, well, realistic, idealistically, um, it's helpful for all organizations like NBC um, and other um, organizations to kind of rally the youth, but it, o overall, I think there needs to be a push for the youth for them to get started. Right. Uh, and, and Lisa, I'm actually going to ask you a question. As a teacher, do you envision any way that uh, students and teachers, even from the same schools, can come together and, and you know work together to support the same causes? Because there's a lot of uh, what I've seen on Twitter is teachers saying, oh, we can't because of, uh, we're at risk of getting fired if we work together with students. But I think, uh, you know, students and teachers more than any other parties really have a lot in common, a lot of the same ideas. And if they work together, I think there's infinite potential. But is that realistic? And how do you think we can make that happen? I think um, what students are expert at or can be expert at, and certainly many of the young people here tonight, um, is the power of social media. And I think, I mean, Zach, you've just done a really great job of this on your own, as well as some of the other young people um, who we've worked with together. So here are kind of the steps that some of you have made, and I think it's 
a really great route, which is um, asking to have a voice at the table, asking to be a part of some of those panels and committees, and at the same time, organizing and speaking through the use of social media like Facebook, Twitter, your own blogs. Uh, many of the young people here have their own blog, have a Facebook and a Twitter presence. So use that power and ask to be on those groups. And even if you're not able to get a place at the table right now, I've seen in cases all over the nation and even internationally that when students' voice is not heard, they've started a movement using social media, bringing their blogs, Facebook and Twitter, to the media's attention. And I think that that's where the young people have some expertise that they can use to get their um, voices heard. And I'm also, Zach, when you're ready, I'm going to be collecting some of the audience questions. So I think keep going on with where you were. And when you're ready, you could just come to me and I can tell you what people are saying in the chat. Definitely. Remind me in like five or so minutes. Uh, I definitely want to get to those. But uh, you actually you provided a great segue. Uh, what I did want to touch upon was, uh, let me find that question. Um, how can we, you talked about how we can use the internet and social media to organize students. But what we have found through our many discussions about you know, students having access to technology and so on, is some of the kids who really want to speak out and, and uh, really want to enhance and elevate their voice, they don't have a way of connecting to other students because they don't have that internet access or, or they're not as uh, social media savvy. So how do we connect with students off of social media? Uh, I think Stephanie, Stephanie recently went to a conference and probably has a lot to say on that topic. Stephanie, are you there? Stephanie? Okay, ter uh, Therese, Stephanie, are you there? Okay, so then I, I guess Teresa or or Hung, uh, I'd love to hear from you on that topic, and then we'll we do, we'll go to uh, Stephanie when she gets back or you know receives better connection. Okay, it's, oh, sorry. Oh, Stephanie, there you are. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with my button. Okay, sorry. Could you briefly repeat that question, Zach? Right, I, I was talking about how, how can we connect with students off of social media, off of the internet, because you know, there, there is a limitation to that. And you definitely have a lot of experience with that, with your experience uh, with your time at the conference. Right. Um, I mean, most of those students actually were on social media, but I can kind of, I guess, maybe suggest some ideas about students who aren't on social media. Is that what I'm touching on? Right. Hello. What's up? I said, is that what I'm talking about? About students who don't have access to social media or don't yes, use yes, social yes. media? How, how okay. Can we organize them? Okay, that is very. It's really interesting um, because I do work with a couple of students who don't use social media. So I mean, aside from the obvious kind of answer of getting them on social media, I think it's just making sure that we are. I guess making that human connection and just if we know that they exist, continue those relationships and kind of gain what they're doing, what they're learning experiences, or maybe even advice that they would want to offer to us. And then we can bring that to social media and then we could bring back what we're learning from social media and take that to them. You know, so it's kind of leaving um, lines of communication open and offering our different experiences so we can both still work towards the same vision and same goal, but we just have different means of doing it. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yes, it definitely answers my question, and I, I think that there, there's a lot to look into and a lot to discuss, and I, I don't know if we're going to find the real answers uh, during this webinar, but I think it's something that we really, really need to look into because we've had so much experience with the, using social media. Uh, I think right. Sue Voice has been great, and I think Facebook has been great. You know, It's a great way of communicating, but more than any other party, I, you know, students don't have a union. Students don't have, some students don't even have social media, so how do they connect to us even? 
how do they reach out to us? How do we make sure that they're aware that other students really want to work with them? Uh, it's not an easy task and something that many people struggle to answer, but I think you provided a great answer and it's something that we will continue to look into. Uh, if some of the other panelists have anything that they'd like to share, that would be great, but otherwise I, I would like to go to uh, uh, some of the questions that we have. Um, yeah, I just want to add more to kind of how um, the sure, young people can connect. And uh, I think that school counselors are a great way for them to, if they don't have a social media site, I think counselors should be given access to kind of opportunities for student organizations that if a student in their school is interested in um, a certain topic, and that the counselors can help them connect to other youth group or organizations. Great, great, great. That's an awesome point. Uh, we've never really discussed the role of counselors, uh, but that, that is a very valuable uh, role. And so maybe maybe it's about making, you know, connecting the students with the counselors around the country. So the counselors connect us with other students. I think that could be uh, something that we uh, could look into. Definitely a great idea, Hung. Uh, so now I definitely would like to go to the audience uh, or the participants. Uh, I see one question from Angela My Myers and then Brandon. So, Angela, uh, go right ahead. Or do I, Lisa, can you activate Angela so she can uh, ask her question? Um, Angela and Brandon, you are activated. So, when you're ready, just click on the talk button and then release it when you're done. I was just going to let Brandon take the mic first. Thanks, Angela. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Um, well, first of all, thanks for making my night because I'm not doing my homework because of this tonight. Uh, <laughs> so I appreciate all this conversation. Just one thing that really stood out to me, uh, we talked a little bit about the, the fact that um, about access and about that many students perhaps don't feel like they have the access to be able to make this point. And I think it actually starts a little bit before that. It starts with this idea that our curriculums in many of our schools don't promote this idea that students should take action. Um, there, there are very few opportunities in which we're able to really show students that they're able to make a difference both in their local community and beyond. And so I think that that's an underlying part that's missing. Uh, and then it's just further complicated by this idea that some of them don't have technology. Uh, some of them are you know, going to schools. It's, it's funny, in a conversation I had with Nikhil a couple weeks ago, I asked him if teachers in his school knew that he was writing this book, and he said no. <laughs> so I'm not sure if he's back on, and maybe they know now. But the reality is, I mean, the fact that the adults don't even know that students are engaged so deeply in this type of work is part of the problem as well. So if we can kind of foster this belief in our students that not only is it, is it their right to be able to take an active role in changing the, the world, but that it's kind of their responsibility as well. I think uh, you'll start to see some of these movements start to coalesce. And that's, that's the question that I still have is how do we create this movement uh, and, and sustain it in a way that it really does bring about change and that people besides NBC and others actually take notice. Because I think it's one thing for the news media to take notice, but for policymakers to understand it. You know, they might take notice, but to really understand what you're advocating for and understand what you need, I think we have a lot more work to do. Great. No, that was, those are great points. Angela, do you have something you want to add to that? Yes, that's a great point, Brandon. I just want to tell you, you have an A from all of us teachers in the room. Um, I think there's several points, and I won't belabor any of them, but I think that you, have, you are definitely representative of the students that, that we're all connecting to that, that want to take action, that want to matter. I put in the chat earlier, this past um, week, 720,000 students in seven continents got together and proclaimed to the world that they, they are making the conscious choice to matter. So the question comes then from how do we leverage all of those voices and we move forward those collective actions so that we can be noticed in a really scalable way. I'm working very, very hard with both educational platforms and, and web platforms to, I'm working right now with the Skype network. In fact, I'm flying there tomorrow so that Skype will be working with us to help build a platform for teachers, for schools, 
for individuals and organizations to leverage their collective talent and passion. And I definitely need your voice and your passion in this work. Um, so I will just give you the Facebook page and I'll give you just a very generic, you know, blog page that we put up just in the last 48 hours. But the best way, if you want to be involved in helping craft this platform and helping give a space to every student who makes the choice to matter, whether that, whether if school collectively supports them or it's an individual teacher, there will be a space built on the web where you can make the choice in how you want to matter, in what way, and collectively that has world-changing implications. So from a media perspective, we have multiple media outlets that are ready and supportive to move this story forward. I've been holding this story back until the platform is created, and we're getting closer and closer every moment. So. Um, if anybody is interested, especially anyone from the student voice in the panel, I so, so would love um, to support what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, that, that's wonderful. And I, I think that, you know, adults such as yourselves who are working to elevate the voices of students are doing some of the greatest service to really uh, our society that could possibly be done because so many students feel helpless and as if no one uh, really cares what they have to say and uh, to show that show them that they care I think is is really really powerful it's incredible it's noble and I, I, I'm I'm very very happy to hear about this and I'm excited to get to work with you as I'm sure are many other students uh, so does anyone else have any questions from the audience, the participants? Does anyone else want to add anything? I know Alexander, uh, you definitely, Alexander Berger uh, joined us today. Uh, he, he is a blogger for Stu Voice. Uh, Alexander, do you have anything you want to add to what's been said so far? If Alexander can't hear me, uh, then we'll, we'll, we can move on. Alexander, are you there? Okay. There we go. Um, I think I'm on now. Oh, there you are. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. Um, really interesting conversation. I really am enjoying this. I think we should keep this webinar thing going. It's a lot more engaging than uh, doing Twitter, although you did get me to create a Twitter account, so I am on Twitter now. <laughs> um, but yeah, lots of interesting points. Um, I'm definitely going to check out. I just signed up for the email list for Choose to Matter. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't have anything unique to add, but I would like to reiterate um, what I believe, uh, I can't remember who said it, but someone said, so students, I think, uh, part of the way organized education currently works is you walk into class, you sit down, and then a teacher tells you what to do. And that's pretty much, you, you know, your entire education is structured in that way. Uh, you know, r small parts of it, extracurriculars, stuff like that, it's self-directed. But in general, we're sort of taught to just sit back and let the teachers tell us what to do. So I think that that's part of the, like, shift um, that needs to happen and that I think that we can help happen just by talking to our friends and giving them a different perspective that education is basically a consumer product and we're the consumers. So we should be able to speak up and, you know, basically ask for the features that we want in our education. And so I think making that mental shift is going to be a big part of what allows us to, um, to actually make a difference in this whole system. Because, you know, we need to get a lot of people actively helping. Um, and if we can make people realize that it's, it's a matter of, you know, <laughs> us asking for what we want and then the teachers as basically our clients giving us the services that we asked for. So anyway, that, that's just my thoughts, but hopefully we'll do this again. And if anybody's interested in following me, my blog is alexanderberger.me. And back to you, Zach. Alexander, uh, thank you. Thank you for your contribution and thank you for working to elevate the student voice. So. What does the student voice mean to you? I think that's something we haven't discussed or haven't discussed in a while. Uh, Stephanie, I know you have had some unique experiences over the past few months, and I'd like to hear from you. 
What does the student voice mean to you and how has that changed over the past few months? Stephanie, is your button not working again? I'd be happy to go to Teresa on this for now. Teresa. Oh, there we go, Stephanie. Go ahead. Stephanie? There All right. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. There we go. Come on. All right. Is it working now? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Sorry. Um, okay, so my personal story oh, I'm going. The ticket next is really bad. Okay. Um, so my personal story is that I mention this often is that I have <laughs> sorry. I haven't always been um this way, I guess really empowering student voices as well as empowering my own. Um back in January, February, which is just six or seven months ago, um I was terribly shy. I didn't really understand the importance of even having a voice. I don't even think I knew what that term meant. Um, I grew up believing that in order to have your voice heard or to be really politically engaged or involved with your community, that you had to be rich, white, all in AP classes, go to Princeton or go to all these, like just these high expectations. And I just never saw myself that way. And coming from an immigrant family, um, that was, we always, it was just never really valued um, or really encouraged, I guess, to really voice your opinion. I was just always taught to go along with authority, just listen to what they say because they're always right. And I guess once I went to Rutgers, I realized that that's not what you really have to do, I'm, that you have a voice and that if something's not right to you, if you feel something is wrong, then by all means, you need to speak up up and say something about it. Um, so I guess finding my voice through my blog, through my Twitter, uh, <laughs> just completely, it, it's crazy how many people read my blog or follow me on Twitter. And it's really, I think, just having the support from other students is another thing that I really want to emphasize. I think I want to be able, Zach, you, Zach, and all the other students that have been there the whole time, you have helped me so much to get me to where I am today. And I think that's another thing that I don't know if we really discussed it, but really, um, I guess, encouraging each other and just realizing how important that support system is because we can't do this movement alone and we need each other. And I think that's how we're really going to start empowering other student voices is to connect with them and make them realize that they have as much a right as we do to have their voices heard. So that's my little... <laughs> It's inspiring, and I'm sure you're not alone. There are many other students out there who, uh, who you know, have uh, feel like they've been silenced and feel like nobody cares. And I think that you serve as a great role model to so show you know, how you can uh, really, you know, become a you know, transform yourself into someone who is an advocate for themselves and also for their peers, and it's, it's really honorable. Uh, Teresa, what do you have to say on this? Uh, what does uh, the student voice mean to me? Is that the question? Yeah. I think uh, to answer that simply, it is not expressing ageism in the United States. Um, we're so fortunate here to have free speech, freedom of speech, and I went to a private high school and I remember what really got me going about education was the more questions I started asking about what was going on and the way things were in my private high school, the more I got into trouble. And that's when I started to realize and really value public education. And from a journalistic standpoint, I'm very uh, interested and passionate about making sure that private schools and people who go to private schools are connected and value public education. Because if we're not all on the same page, then nothing will ever get done. And so um, I think just to, to answer that simply, it's not expressing, <laughs> not discriminating, basically, based on age in the United States because everyone's voice means something and they deserve to be at the table especially in education, and that's that's just the, that's the bottom line. Right. Well put. And uh, Matthew Wilson, if you're there in the audience, I'll give you a chance to get set up. 
uh, we'll go to Hung next, but uh, I'd like to hear from you and about your experience, you know, with your Congressional Youth Council. Uh, but we'll go to Hung first, and then Matthew, uh, I'd love to hear from you. So, Hung, go right ahead. What does the student voice mean to you? Um, the student voice means that I have an opportunity to kind of um, express my uh, kind of how I feel regarding my education and try to change that. But for me, mostly it has been um, student action because throughout my high school years, if I dislike the class or if I dislike something, I immediately like go to my counselor and talk to her that I don't want this class anymore. I want something else. It doesn't fit me, and um, it and I I bring that to the policy level too by kind of sharing um, to my my representatives about um, high school requirements and all of that. And so student voices and extremely thing that uh, I hold near my heart because like um, Stephanie has mentioned, I am, I mean like her, I I am from an immigrant family and uh, growing up it's been hard to kind of not know how the system works but when I realized that I have the same abilities as everyone else, I just kind of took that and ran with it and uh, kind of just take the opportunity to kind of voice and take action whenever I can. Great. Matthew, here. Have you figured things out? Are you able to uh, chime in here? There, go right ahead, Matthew. Just press the talk button when you're ready. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Matthew Wilson, and I'm a member of Congressman Larson's Congressional Youth Cabinet. He's a congressman from my home state, um, from Connecticut. And I guess the question, what does the student voice mean to me? is um, a, a government in which students are actively engaged rather than participate in the civic process, a government in which that adults realize that students and youth are an untapped constituency that actually are able to not only improve existing federal dollars that, allo that are allocated, but is actually saving money in doing so. Um, the congressman that um, I work for um, has been really instrumental in engaging youth and he actually brought a bunch of us down to Washington DC to introduce a, um, a the resolution for the creation of a president's youth cabinet. So um, while personally I see it as a grassroots movement in rolling out congressional youth cabinets which is um, two students from every high school within a congressional district um, I, I do see it rolling out throughout the United States to not only get students civically engaged, but to somehow connect that to how students can be involved in their own education. So Matthew, not everyone is so fortunate to have, uh, you know, their, their policymakers actually listening to them and caring for uh, uh, their the student voice. Uh, do you see this as an effective tool? Do you think Congressman Larson has been, become aware of issues that he would not normally become aware of uh, through this youth council? Am I? Yep, you're good. Okay. Um, yes, I think the congressman or through my experience, I've been on the cabinet for about two years and it's really opened my eyes into a wide range of youth centric issues personally and for those who are not who are not as fortunate as, as I who have been like selected to be and work with the congressman we what we try and do is we try to hold a bunch of field hearings every year um, in which we can get youth to come out and talk about certain issues so we held a, a field healing called children in the recession at the Connecticut State Capitol where anybody regardless of age but it was focused on children there were children as young as six years old giving testimony about how the recession affected them and that actually led to a piece of Connecticut state legislation called an act concerning children in the recession that led to a bunch of triggers to be put into place so when an unemployment and falls under a certain level in the state of Connecticut a bunch of 
um, federally funded and state funded dollars will go into anti-poverty programs. So it is, we, it's difficult to engage those who are not as for, obviously who do not have the opportunities that we do, but it's imperative that we do so. Even if they have different political views than us or, or differing views on anything, frankly, but we have to give the reason that we're all so passionate and we're able to do this is because we were afforded the opportunity. We were afforded that partnership. And I think that having that, having an, an adult partnership or other youth that can show, oh, this is what we did as a result of having that voice, that's what we need to get everybody involved. Great. Thank you. And I'd also like to touch upon another issue. Uh, you know, there is the issue of policymakers, uh, you know, representing students overall, but then there are those the students that we overlook, uh, those with uh, special needs. And Clement has been working for, Clement Colson has been working for the Special Olympics, and I'd like Clement to uh, talk about his uh, work with Unify. Clement, go right ahead. Clement, just raise your hand and then press talk. Clement? All right, if that's not working, uh, I will, uh, I would like, is that Clement? Ooh. Yep, there we go. Go ahead, Clement. Awesome. Oh, sorry about that. Um, awesome. My name is Clement Colston, as Zach said, and um, I'm with Special Olympics Project Unify. And what we are is we are um, youth um, who are in middle school, high school, and college. And we represent and advocate for and with people with disabilities. A lot of what we focus on is seeing the strengths and abilities that all students can contribute. I truly believe that we all can be leaders. We all have special gifts. We all have special talents. But we have to open our eyes up to see that in others. Too often we look at labels or look at limitations and see that as um, barriers. But um, I actually have another colleague on this call, um, Caitlin Smith, and she um, has been really instrumental as well in voicing that friendships between people with without disabilities are not only crucial just um, for uh, friendship-wise in a sense, but really building school climate where all people are accepted for uh, diversity and um, can contribute positive uh, social change. So um, I'm actually going to be in uh, Korea in January for the Global Youth Activation Summit where about 15 countries throughout the United States are going to be talking about how we can move together on our pathway towards social justice for all people. And one of the highlights of that is really seeing youth as leaders of today. We are not the leaders of tomorrow. We are actively taking roles, but um, the adults also have to learn that, you know what, it is hard to... Uh, to kind of step back sometimes and let the youth leave, but if they don't give us the chance, then change will not happen. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Clement, for uh, representing that important group of uh, students. So, now with the last 10 minutes, I'd like to talk about where we go moving forward. Uh, how can we improve the student voice chat? How can we reach out to more students? Um, I'd also like to talk about, uh, you know, how do we really become a, a stronger unit of students, whether it be uh, through a student union, uh, through grassroots efforts, whatever it may be. How do we make sure that the student voice is heard uh, by teachers, policymakers, to ensure that parents, we're working together with parents, together with teachers, really working together with everyone at the same table a level playing field where everyone has an equal say and the students are among those who have that say. So uh, I guess I'll start with Hung and then we'll move down the line, even to the audience as well. Can we um, empower student voice? Was that the question? How do we, moving forward, how do we ensure that the student voice is heard? How do okay. we improve stuff like the student voice chat and, and so on and so forth? How do we 
take the next step? We have worked, utilized social media and so on, but how do we take that next step? Um, well, personally, my opinion is that for students, we've mostly kind of talked about, well, when we um, approach our policymakers, we mostly talk about kind of the things we dislike or like, but then we don't really offer kind of things we want them to kind of improve on. And so what, what I think, um, how, how we move forward is actually kind of building our own kind of action plan or document and kind of share it with our policymakers and say this is what we want happen. And, and I think that's a really um, constructive way to kind of point out what's wrong but also kind of offering what we want. I think we just had Nikhil join. Uh, so if that is Nikhil, uh, I'd like to have you answer the question of how we take that next step. Um, really talk about everything that you just done, and also, uh, you know, but how do we take that next step as a student voice to make sure that the student voice is heard? How are you taking okay. that next step, and how can all students really work together? Okay. Yeah. Um, I really do think that one of the most important things that we have to realize is that we have a large group of students who are frustrated with their education, and um, they have certain complaints, they have suggestions. And if we bring together all different backgrounds, we have students of color, of, of all different um, schools, then might have just lost the policy. Push for certain policy decisions in our country. And Zach and Zach and two voices have done that very, very well, at least with um, having a voice on the New York State Education Commission. And start speaking at your board, at your board, board meetings. That's really it. Josh Hopkins, the youngest elected official in New York City history, is an 18-year-old who just started speaking out and was elected on a school board. Anybody can do this. And I think it starts, starts small. And then as you pick up the pace, um, all the seeds start sowing, and people start to realize and understand what's going on. Because never before in history have, it, have we ever thought of having students in control and, and um, have some voice. So, this is revolutionary, and you have to start convincing parents and educators that this is very valid on many cases. Amen. Uh, Stephanie, uh, I, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, Nikhil touched upon, you know, really important points on how we can, uh, um, you know, yeah, what what students can do, but how can we show students that they that show students that they can. Uh, make students believe that they can. I know I've asked a similar question before, but expand upon that while also talking about how we can take that next step with student voice. Okay. Um, I guess, like you said, I mentioned a lot of this before, but just to reemphasize my point is kind of making others realize that we are really no different, I guess, in a way, and that we should all start sharing. I mean, I'm not going to tell everyone to start sharing their personal stories, but I think um, a lot of workshops that I've attended, or even just from personal experience, when people share their personal stories on why they believe that student voice is, that their voice is important, or how Definitely. they found their voice, that really sparks something in people that no other person can really do. And because it's so relatable, because we're already all students, then that's, I think, that gives people confidence. And I think that's what happened to me once I saw people like yourself and Nikhil and even younger students starting to speak up so unafraid or just realizing that we have to speak up or other people are, are going to start making decisions for us. So, again, I think it's just really showing people that they can do it. If we can do it, then they can absolutely 100% do it as well. And I guess with do voice and just other means of doing it, we have to provide them the tools and make them realize that we're here to help them along the way. Yeah, I, I like that point about sharing your stories. I think that that is probably the next step that we should take to give students a forum to share their stories. I think Stu Voice has done that, but I think we should encourage the or emphasize the fact that they should be sharing their stories. In, in the remaining three minutes, uh, Teresa, do you have anything else that you'd like to add or anyone else in, uh, in this conference? 
Yeah, I'd like to touch on uh, what you know what Brandon mentioned in a lot of just in these final minutes. But um, social institutions, it begins with the family, and then we enter the classroom, and that's really where it starts. And we have this idea that you know students are really like these receptacles, and then the teacher tells us everything that we need to know. And if from the very beginning now we can start including students more in the ways in which we develop things in the classroom. So instead of the teacher planning field trips, the students plan field trips. And pretty soon it emanates from the classroom. Student involvement in the classroom emanates away from the classroom and into the entire school community. And so really I think, you know, paring, paring down this large student voice movement if we can really focus on people uh, having their voice in their own small schools and really focusing on the strength and numbers within communities, that that's really where it's going to be. And it starts with a personal story. Because I, I can definitely uh, attest to this, but we each had our own personal story. And at some point, what kept us going was the connection. And, and us being able to see that, oh look, there's people like Zach and Nikhil and Stephanie and Matt, and there are so many other students who took their personal stories, and we were able to make that connection. If we can find ways to connect students with one another within their own communities, then that is the key. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. I think that you, you very well said. Uh, does anyone in the audience have anything that they would like to add as we wrap up? I see Alexander seems uh, eager to share his thoughts. Alexander, you have a, about 15, sec 15, 20 seconds. Okay, I just wanted to say, so I think Teresa was saying sort of a bottom-up method, which I'm sh definitely is valuable. I think something you might want to consider is uh, a little bit of a top-down method, even though that seems kind of like the old system. If we were able to develop like a specific ask, I'd definitely be interested in working on a document that was like, look, here's what's wrong, here's our exact ideas on how we can fix it, and here is our body of students that agree with this. We could maybe create something where we could just be like, hey, policymaker, here's, here's our thoughts condensed and very clearly written. Please help us with these specific asks that we have for you. That's just my thoughts. Anyway, great webinar. Thank you. Great points, Alex, and I definitely think that that uh, we actually are, are working on some of those specific asks, and I, I would love to uh, reach out to you to work with you on that and anyone else who's interested. You know, the student voice movement is as much uh, mine as it is yours as it is, as it is the next student's, and we need to make every student feel that way. Um, with that, I'd like to thank Steve for hosting us, Lisa for helping me put this together, and if anyone has any last uh, words, uh, please feel free to share. Uh, I would love to point those who haven't already visited stewvoice.org to visit it, stewvoice.org, or join our mo weekly Monday uh, Twitter chats, hashtag stewvoice. I think this webinar was a great success, and we should definitely do it again. Uh, it definitely uh, gave me a lot to think about, and hopefully gave everyone else a lot to think about. So thank you for joining, and if anyone else has any last words, you know, feel free to chime in, but uh, I I'm very excited about where Stu Voice is going to go, and uh, I'm very happy uh, and excited uh, by, by all of you. So thank you. If no one has anything else to say, I, I think that uh, we, we can close this webinar. So thank you all for joining. Great webinar. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.